As we gather together and as we have some time for Bible study this week, uh, I've gotten into a number of different questions over the course of the last week. So we'll just say right up from today's Bible study is going to be all Q and A. Uh, I've gotten a number of questions. Thank you for calling me, for emailing me. Um, I'm glad that everybody took my advice and nobody sent their questions via carrier pigeon last week. So as we get ready to have some time together in God's word, let's open up with a word of prayer. Dear God, we thank you so much that you are faithful. You are with us. You are the one who is in charge of this world. And you have promised to never, ever leave our side. So, Lord, thank you. Uh, we ask that you may guide our time together as we have this time with one another and as we are able to open up God's word together. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. So, I will tell you, for Bible study today, you will need a Bible. Uh, we're going to walk through and I'm going to take a look at some of the different questions that uh, you guys have asked over the course of the last week. And I'll give you the Bible verses on the screen to look up, but I'll just tell you right up front, I'm not going to print the Bible verses on the screen. For Bible study, you will have to open up a Bible. So that's your heads up now to either pause the video or be able to uh, grab out a uh, Bible that you have at home or open up your Bible app on your phone or your tablet. So we've got a couple of questions we're going to walk through today. So let's start out with our first one. First question that had come in was, is God punishing us with this virus? Uh, we'll see this with this question and also with pretty much all of our questions that we'll have today that there's lots of different answers um, or theories floating around out there about these different questions and how to answer them. And some Christians are even answering some of these questions and differently. Um, and oftentimes they have good intentions and sometimes they may even quote Bible verses to support their answers. So let's go to God's word with how we will answer these questions and how we see God's word speaking to us today. So in our very first question, is God punishing us with this virus? A great passage for us to be able to open up to is Luke chapter 13. Now open up your Bibles uh, to Luke chapter 13. Now this is taking place as uh, Jesus is talking uh, with some people, and they're asking some different questions, and Jesus has been able to dive into and to be able to answer them. And some of the people around him were struggling with some things that had happened. Uh, we're kind of asking these questions about, eh, why are these bad things happening in the world around them? Now, normally in Bible study, this would be the time where I would ask, hey, could somebody read this passage for us? Well, right now, you're more than welcome to be able to read the passage out loud, but nobody else watching on the internet will be able to hear you. So I'll go ahead and read our Bible passages for us. So if we're reading here from Luke chapter 13, and we'll go verses 1 through 5. Now there were some present at that time who told Jesus about the Galileans, whose blood Pilate had mixed with their sacrifices. And Jesus answered, Do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered this way? I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you too will all perish. Or those 18 who died when the tower in Siloam fell on them, do you think they were more guilty than all the others living in Jerusalem? I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you too will all perish. So going on at this time, there was some incident. Uh, it appears that there must have been some people who were killed while performing the sacrifices, being in worship uh, in the temple. And then there was also another terrible accident where this tower fell, fell down and ended up, as it looks like, killing 18 people. So then the question was, well, is God punishing them 
Is it something wrong that they did? Uh, are they, were they in trouble for this? Is this something that God is doing to specifically target them? Now, we don't have a lot of other historical context to these events, so we don't have a, a parallel passage to go to. But even though we don't have another passage to go to, Jesus is very clear. He says, I tell you, no, but unless you repent, you too will all perish. When some of the people were asking, is God punishing them with these accidents? Jesus flat out and says, no, you're missing the point. The point is not, is God punishing them? The point is sin. There's a reality of sin in this world. And when we see the terrible things around us, that's not an opportunity to ask, ooh, whose fault is it? Is God punishing them? No. When we see these terrible things happening, when we see terrible viruses, that this is an opportunity to realize that we sin and that we need Jesus. It's a reflection of how there's brokenness in the world around us and we need Jesus. Another great passage for us to be able to go to uh, is from John chapter 9. And we're going to go to this one. If it sounds a little bit familiar, this was our gospel reading from last week. And then we also, uh, this was also then the text for last week's sermon as well. So let's turn on over to John chapter 9. If you're in Luke, you can grab a pinch of pages, go to the next book in the Bible. That'll be John chapter 9. Here then, this is the beginning where of this incredible account that John records, a very long reading. We spent a lot of time with it last week in the sermon. And so then here is somebody who was born blind. And again, people are kind of asking a similar question as, is God punishing this person? I read here from John chapter 9. We'll do verses 1 through 5. As he, that is Jesus, went along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus, but this happened so that the work of God might be displayed in his life. As long as it is day, we must do the work of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Again, some of the people are asking, mm, this guy who's blind, is it his fault? Is it his parents' fault? Is God punishing them? Again, Jesus redirects their question and says, you're asking the wrong question. That's not the point. The point is, God is faithful in the midst of this. That this happened so that the work of God might be displayed in his life. God's going to be present with him throughout this situation, and God's going to be able to bring about good from the situation. Not that the blindness was good, not to excuse or dismiss the suffering this guy was going through. Instead, Jesus was reframing it to be able to show people that this is God at work. God is with him in the midst of this suffering, and God will bring about good through it. The point is not focusing on the sin that he committed or if God's punishing him. The point is how God is at work. And in fact, Jesus even says that as long as it's day, we've got work to do. He doesn't just say I. He says we. We have got work to do as long as it is day. The night he's talking about here is the end of time is when he returns, when the resurrection takes place. And until that time, it's still day. There's still work for us to do. And so the short answer is God punishing us with this virus? No. We have no scripture passage to be able to go to that this is some specific punishment that God has lined up in connection to some specific sin. Instead, Jesus redirects us to be able to say that he is at work throughout this, and he is faithful. This question ties in a lot with our very next question that we've got coming. Why is this happening? Again, there are so many different answers floating around out there. And again, 
we're not answering this from a medical perspective. We're not answering this from the point of view of saying, why is this happening? As in like, you know, why, why is it spreading? Why are these germs spreading to other people? Uh, how do we wash our hands more? That's not what we're at, about to answer here. We're looking at this more from a spiritual perspective of why is all this going on? Why is this coronavirus, this COVID-19 going around and so many people are getting sick and some people are even dying from it? And there are some people who have gotten the virus and are already over it and are better again. Why is all of this going on in our world where we are now at a stay at home? We've got all these things going on in our world. Why is this happening? Again, Jesus partially answers this with the Bible passages we've already looked at. But another great one to be able to go to is Romans chapter 8. Let's open up to Romans 8. So if you go from John, you're going to go a number of pages back again to be able to get all the way back to Romans chapter 8. Now, as Paul's writing to these Christians in Rome, now they had a lot of rough stuff going on. Uh, they're going through a lot of suffering and some hard times and persecution was kind of getting starting to ramp up there, especially in Italy. And so Paul also writes about the hard times we go through and how do we approach that as Christians. So as we're looking here in Romans chapter 8, now let's be honest, the entire chapter is fantastic. Now, uh, you know, Romans 8 is great. Uh, it's a great way to remember it because the whole chapter is fantastic. So in your own devotions, I would commend you and encourage you to spend some time in Romans chapter 8 and just read through this chapter because there's so much good stuff in it. Now, for the sake of time, we'll kind of jump kind of straight into the midst of it. As we're jumping down here to Romans 8, uh, going down to verse 22, let's start with just verse 22. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth, right up to the present time. So as we're looking about why this is happening, why these hard times, why the suffering is going on, first off, then, Paul directs us to why this is happening. We start skimming over these verses and looking especially with leading up to this passage. The answer, once again, is simple. It's sin. Just because there's sin in this world. Uh, that our world is broken, it is affected, it is tainted by sin. In fact, there's, there's brokenness in creation. There is sickness, there is disease, there's terrible weather. Uh, there's all these bad things that happen in the world. It's just because of sin, plain and simple. And I love the picture that he uses here. Think about this. You know, the whole creation, all of creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. The, the pains of childbirth, that, that inc like incredibly awful, unimaginable amount of pain that just seems like it's consuming everything and just takes over everything. That's that picture of creation, of our world, of these diseases going around. This picture of a woman in childbirth, of that pain she is going through. There's nothing fun about the pain. There's nothing pleasant about it. There's nothing to be encouraged about that pain. It is not a good thing. And that's kind of what this sickness and this pain in the world is like. It's like all of creation is tainted by sin. It's like all of creation is just groaning as in this pain that we are going through. And he continues here. Let's read verses 23. Not only so, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit, grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. And so we can look at the world around us and we can see kind of the brokenness and the pain and the heartache uh, going on in the world around us. But it's not just an out there thing. Sin doesn't just affect things out that way. It also affects things in here. It also affects us as well. And so disease, viruses, even affect us as well. It's all because of sin, the pain, the brokenness of this creation. But this picture of a woman in childbirth, such a great image in that childbirth doesn't last forever. 
Sometimes it can go on a while. Sometimes it can go on far longer than the mom wants it to. But it never goes on forever. There is always an end time. This is this incredible picture of showing how we're going through these sufferings, we're going through these struggles, and it won't last forever. It won't. It is painful, it's unpleasant, it's no fun right now. But there will come a time when it does come to an end. As we're looking forward to the adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies, how God's going to fix our bodies. He's going to fix all of this brokenness in the world. He's going to fix all the viruses. He's going to fix all that one day when he returns, he will set everything right. And I love how he phrases it here in verses 24 and 25. For in this hope we were saved. But hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what he already has? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. This hope, this promise of how Jesus went to the cross to win forgiveness in life for us, this hope and this promise of how one day Jesus will return and will set everything right, this hope and this promise is exactly God's promise to us today. And in this hope, we are saved. It saves our lives. And it's not perfect yet. If we already had this hope, if we were already in the resurrection, if everything was already perfect, then we wouldn't have anything to look forward to. Right now, we've got a lot to look forward to. We've got a lot to look forward to of God fixing our world and setting everything right. If we already had it, we'd have nothing to hope for. But we look forward to it because our hope is a sure deal. As we kind of keep skimming down, you can go even in, you know, even into um, like verses of, you know, 26, 27, how like sometimes we don't even know what to pray for. And yet the Holy Spirit is so faithful that God even prays in our behalf. And we're not even sure where to start the conversation with God. He's even praying in our behalf. So many great reassurances of how God calls us, he, how we've got him in it. He's got us in our, his hand. How there's nothing that can separate us. And all of this comes to a climax, comes to a finish. And some of my favorite verses in Scripture, here in verses 38 and 39. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth nor anything else in all creation, will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Jesus Christ, our Lord. Absolutely nothing can separate us from God's love. Why is this happening? You know, the short answer is sin. But even as all of this is happening, we know no matter what, God is with us and he is in charge. Can we give a specific answer why all this is going on? Is God trying to turn our hearts back to him? Is God trying to make us pause from our lives and give us an opportunity to serve and be in connection with one another? It, why? The short answer is, we don't know. We don't. We can make some guesses, but at the end of the day, they're just that. They're guesses. The only thing we know for sure is that this is happening because of the sin in this world, and this is exactly the sin and disease and brokenness that Jesus went to the cross to save us from, and that he will one day return and fix all of it. Let's go on to our next question. The next major question uh, I've gotten is, are we in the end times? Uh, as we're looking at all these things going on around us, some of these headlines, um, are we in the end times? Because actually, if you turn on the TV and you listen to some radio stations and go online, there's some pastors that are making a pretty strong case saying, this is it. This is it. We are in the end times. This is exactly what Jesus said was about to happen. Um, they're even quoting some different Bible passages to say, see, look, this, this shows exactly that Jesus is just about ready to return. It's about ready to happen. You can bank on it. So let's open up God's word. Let's hear what Jesus has to say. Uh, for this one, let's open up to Matthew chapter 24. Uh, here in Matthew chapter 24 uh, and 25, Jesus has so many great things that he's especially talking a lot about end times. Uh, he's there, it's in Holy Week, 
uh, in just a matter of days. Jesus is going to be on the cross. Um, he's going to die and rise again. Like all this is going to be coming and, and unfolding in the next week for Jesus. So as he's there in and around Jerusalem, he's sharing with the people a lot of important teachings. Um, and there's also a lot of questions about end times coming up. A lot of people are asking, is this it? Should we be ready? So uh, let's pick back up here at uh, Matthew chapter 24, uh, starting at verse 1. Jesus left the temple and was walking away with his disciples, came up to him to call his attention to its building. Do you see all these things? He asked. I tell you the truth. Not one stone here will be left on another. Every one will be thrown down. Jesus is talking about how this incredible, beautiful temple and just all the incredible architecture in Jerusalem will one day be destroyed. So let's keep going. As Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately. Tell us, they said, when will this happen? And what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? So as they're right there, Mount Olives, they're overlooking Jerusalem, they're right by it. And they're saying, all right, so Jesus, how do we know? How do we know if we're in the end times? How do we know if all this is about ready to unfold and to start coming all crashing down on us. How do we know? So Jesus answers both them and us. Verse 4. Jesus answered, Watch out, that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name, claiming, I am the Christ, and will deceive many. You will hear of wars and rumors of wars, but see to it that you are not alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of birth pains. Did you catch it? There's that birth imagery again. The, the, the suffering, the, 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 the effects of sin in this world. And he lists off some pretty specific effects of this world being tainted and affected by sin. He talks about how there will be wars, nations will be against other nations, kingdom against kingdoms, famines, earthquakes. I mean, all these terrible things happening. It's because of the sin and the brokenness of this creation. So he says, so these are the signs of the end times. When you see all of these brokenness in creation. So, is all of this going on right now? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you don't have to watch the news very long to see, boy, huh, sounds pretty much exactly like what's going on right now. And this is what's going on right now. So are we in the end times? Yes. Yes, we are. You know what's also interesting? When Jesus said these words, guess what? This stuff was happening at that moment. This stuff was happening right then. His disciples right there in the first century heard those words and looked around and said, whoa, we're in the end times. And then Christians in the second century read these words and said, whoa, all this is happening. We're in the end times. Then Christians in the third century read these words and said, whoa, all this is happening. We're in the end times. We can read this even, uh, you read uh, especially a lot of the different, uh, we call them the reformers, uh, like Martin Luther and some of the other guys are writing, especially in and around like the 15th century. For them, again, things were rough. You hear them writing and they read these words and they say, whoa, what's this happening? We're in the end times. Go back 100 years ago, people heard these words and said, whoa, we're in the end times. So are we in the end times? Yeah, we are. We've been in the end times since Jesus said these words and we'll keep being in the end times until he returns. Now we could keep reading our way through Matthew 24 and 25. It's all fantastic stuff. And in your own devotions, I encourage you to take some more time to read through this chapter. But let's jump on down then to even uh, verse like 42. Again, Jesus says, Therefore keep watch, because you do not know on what day your Lord will come. 
Again, then he echoes this again in verse 44. So you also must be ready because the son of man will come at an hour when you do not expect him. So are we in the end times? Yes. Can we look at these things and say that Jesus is coming soon? Yes. Might Jesus show up tomorrow? Yes. Might Jesus not show up for another thousand years? Yes. Do we know when he will show up? Nope. And that's the point. That's the point. That's why these words come true. Every single generation, ever since Jesus said these words 2,000 years ago, every single generation has been able to read them and to say, whoa, this is coming true. Jesus could show up at any minute. Wow, I should take this gospel stuff seriously. And that's the point. That's the point. That Jesus is saying that as we look at the world around us, as we see this sickness going on, yeah, it's a reminder of how we are in the birth pains, the, the aching and the groaning and the awful pain of sin in this world. And one day, he will return. It could be at any moment. So we get the joy of being ready of looking forward to being ready at any moment for Jesus to be able to return and to set everything right. So let's go to our final question. So for our final question, probably the question that I've gotten hands down the most in the last week is what can I do? Like as a Christian, as a part of our church family, as just a, a member of society, like what can I do? What should I be? doing. I would say there's a couple of, I mean, there's many different ways to be able to answer this, but a couple of things to be able to highlight of things to be able to bear in mind and things that you can be able to participate in. First and foremost, pray. Have time together in prayer. Uh, if, you, if you have somebody else at home, pray with them. If there's nobody else at home, pray by yourself. Have that time of conversation with God. Uh, you can also have the opportunity to be able to call somebody up and pray together on the phone, something we're probably not very used to doing. But since we can't be there together in person, that's an opportunity to be able to pray with one another. Others, obviously, as we're going to prayer, there's so many great passages in Scripture we can be able to go to. Uh, so many classic passages about the, the gift of prayer, the joy of prayer, what it means to be able to speak with our Heavenly Father at any time, day or night. So I would say for this one, uh, let's go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Now, we don't always have the chance to dive into uh, Paul's letters to the Thessalonians. So let's go to Thessalonians chapter 5. So in Thessalonica, Paul was writing to these Christians, and they had a lot of questions about end times, about Jesus' return, about the, the struggles and the pain and the sickness and the, all the effects of sin going on in the world around them. So Paul talks a lot about the end times, talks a lot about what to expect with Jesus' return. And as he's coming down to the final words of this first letter, he's getting in all those final things, kind of that Minnesotan goodbye, kind of all those other things he wants to hurry up and get in um, and to mention to them before the end of his letter. So we'll jump into 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, and we'll read verses 16 through 18. Where Paul writes, Be joyful always. Pray continually. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Especially verse 17, pray continually. Uh, some translations, it's uh, like pray without ceasing. Uh, it's that, you know what, no matter what's going on, take it to the Lord in prayer. Uh, if things are going great, Take it to the Lord in prayer. Things are not going great. Take it to the Lord in prayer. If you're not sure what else to do, take it to the Lord in prayer. Uh, and so we can, and no matter what's going on, even in the midst of our questions, even in the midst of our struggles, we can always be joyful, always, and pray continually. We can give thanks in all circumstances. So there is always something to be thankful for. There's always a way that God is blessing us, that he's carrying us, that he's reminding us of his faithfulness. There's always a way that God is there with us and for us. And so we can always 
give thanks in all circumstances. This is also why this is sometimes in a part of one of our readings, especially on Thanksgiving Eve, on this end of First Thessalonians 5, is that classic thing, one of the classic Thanksgiving readings, because it talks about always giving thanks. And it, verse 18 ends here with, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. It's in our own best interest to give thanks and to pray. So no matter what's going on, pray. Whatever's weighing on your heart, pray. Take it to God. He's there. He's there to hear you. When answering the question of what can I do, uh, another huge thing is to be in contact with each other. Uh, this is an incredible opportunity to be able to connect with one another, to write somebody a note, write them a letter, give them a phone call, shoot them a text, uh, you know, send them an email, you know, just to be in contact with one another. Uh, when, with everything going on, especially now with a stay at home order in place, uh, so many people are at home even more than usual. And so this is the opportunity to be able to connect with each other since we can't be there together in person, since honestly, there's only one of me and only four elders, this is an opportunity for us to be able to connect with each other, uh, to be able to speak with one another, uh, especially with our weekly updates. If there's a chance that you think somebody may not have gotten the update, or if you usually get the update, but all of a sudden you didn't get one one week or something, call each other, be in contact with each other. If somebody doesn't have email, if somebody doesn't have the internet, um, someone doesn't have a phone or a tablet or a computer or a smartphone, then give them a call. See what ways that you can be of assistance to them to connect with them and to be able to pass on the updates and to be able to share with them whatever resources we can. A fantastic Bible passage to be able to go to here is Philippians chapter 2. Uh, so if you're in Thessalonians, uh, grab a little pinch of pages going back to the left, uh, you'll have Colossians, and then you'll hit Philippians. As Paul's writing to the Christians in Philippi, uh, he starts out here in chapter 2, especially talking about the example of Christ's humility, uh, how Christ humbled himself, humbled himself all the way to going to the cross, and humbled himself in order to serve us and to save us. And so let's go back then here to uh, Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. Paul writes, If you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any fellowship with the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and purpose. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility, consider others better than yourselves. Each of you should not only look to your own interests, but also the interests of others. That says it all. We're to be in contact with one another, care for one another, support one another. That he says that, you know, that each of you should not only look to your own interests, but also the interests of others. Uh, as we go, as we move ahead, as we're going through these times together, we're there to be able to help each other. Can we physically be uh, around each other a lot at this point? Not advisable. Um, just to be able to slow the spread of this coronavirus and to be able to help everybody to be able to get healthier sooner. But there are many other ways that we can be, support each other other than being side by side in person. We pray for each other and be in contact. Give a phone call, especially if you think somebody is by themselves or alone or may not have the updates of what's going on. Share the updates with them so that they can be a part of what's going on as well. And we look to the interests of others. See if there's ways to help somebody out. If you're making a swing by the grocery store, give somebody a call and be like, hey, hey, I'm at the grocery store. This, you know, the shelves actually aren't stripped bare. Is there anything I can get you? Um, you know, how are you doing? Are you stocked up on toilet paper? That we have opportunities to be able to be there and to support each other and to encourage each other. I would say the third way of what can I do to help, again, is to be prepared, not panic. So our God is faithful. He is with us. He is in charge. He's got us. 
yes, we are prepared. Yes, we take precautions and do what we can to be able to protect one another and to look to the interests of others and to help keep each other safe. But that doesn't mean we fall into panic. A uh, great passage to be able to go to here is Luke chapter 21. So as you're here in Philippians, you can keep turning back to the left as we get back to Luke's gospel, chapter 21. Again, this is uh, kind of a parallel passage to where we had read from Matthew. Uh, this is then as Jesus is there. It's the final week he's, uh, of his earthly ministry. He's getting ready, about ready to go to the cross uh, for us. And so, again, questions about end times are coming up. So now I love it how Luke records it for us here. As we go verses 25 through 28, Luke records, There will be signs in the sun, moon, and stars. On the earth, nations will be in anguish and perplexity at the roaring and tossing of the sea. Men will faint from terror, apprehensive of what is coming on the world, for the heavenly bodies will be shaken. At that time, they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud and with power and great glory. When these things begin to take place, stand up and lift up your heads, because your redemption is drawing near. There will be signs of Jesus' return. There will be signs when things will be going scary and uncertain, and we won't quite understand what is all going on. And yet, God is faithful. Now, when we see the scariness in the world and people are fainting from terror, it's an opportunity to be prepared, not panicked, to show for how us as Christians, we live differently, uh, that we have a comfort, we have a reassurance, we have a peace of knowing that our God is faithful, even in the midst of these hard times. Luke doesn't say, record these words of Jesus and say, when things get bad, you should panic shop and stock up on toilet paper for an entire year. No, we're prepared, but we're not panicked. If there's, a, if there's a couple rolls of toilet paper left on the uh, shelf and we've got plenty of toilet paper at home, we leave it for the next person. Because who knows, maybe that person coming in was just about out and genuinely needs it. We can be prepared, not panicked. Yes, we wash our hands. Yes, we keep our social distance and do what we can to help slow the spread of this virus. But that, this doesn't mean that we stay locked up in our, in our bathroom at home and try and shut off the outside world and we're terrified of what's to come. No, God is faithful. We're prepared. We don't put the Lord to the test. We don't do foolish things and go around licking doorknobs. But we're also not panicked. We're also not hiding in fear about what's going on because we know God is faithful and this too shall pass. So as we continue moving forward, each week. Again, I open up the floor for any questions. If you have any questions, please feel free to let me know. Um, again, you can call me, email me, send me whatever questions. If there's things that you'd like for us to be able to talk about and specifically address in our Bible study, we'll do that. What we'll also do kind of how we've oftentimes done our Sunday morning Bible studies uh, is that uh, if you've got questions, we'll absolutely be able to take the time to be able to answer them. And if there isn't any questions, then we'll have a specific study that we'll be able to walk through. Um, and if you've got a specific study, if you've got like a, a book of the Bible or a topic that you'd like for us to especially walk through, let me know. Um, let me know how I can be able to help equip you and to be able to feed you with God's word. So as we end our time together, uh, let's end our time as we oftentimes like to end our Bible studies here at New Life with the Lord's Prayer and the Common Doxology. Let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, 
Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Thank you for joining us for our Bible study today. God is faithful, and this too shall pass.